This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week's episode is brought to you again by the Friends of the Magic Word. In case you're looking for something to buy for something, someone special this holiday season, why not consider a donation or a monthly pledge to the Magic Word podcast and becoming a friend of the Magic Word? Because that way that you will feel good about yourself and also you could receive some pretty cool perks along the way if you become a regular patron by pledging to the Magic Word. If you just go to the Magic Word Podcast.com, there you'll find a tab where you can find out more information and your financial support will certainly help to keep this podcast going. By the way, the last uh, couple of weeks we've been running a contest that is for a couple of copies of books from Eileen McFalls, who is the author of No Ordinary Magic, which was about her memoirs of traveling with the late great street, street magician, Mr. Uh, Jim Cellini. And so at the end of this podcast, I'm going to announce the names of the winners. And I just want to say congratulations to those guys, uh, those people early on right now. And for those of you who had entered the contest. Uh, Sorry, you may not have won this one, but we have not one, but two more contests that are going to be running, and we'll tell you about those on the back end of this episode then as well. And one of them, in fact, is going to be exclusively for our international listeners. We have a lot of people who it seems have been left out because a lot of times these hard copies are not easily shipped overseas because of the prohibitive postage charges involved with trying to ship overseas. So We've got something that's going to be available for our international listeners exclusively. So listen for that at the end of this podcast then as well. Speaking of this podcast, we've got just an outstanding person who I have been wanting to talk to for a while. And I am so delighted that I had a chance to kind of catch him in between gigs, if you will. He's been very busy with a lot of things going on virtually, that he has various kinds of Zoom shows that are going on currently. But also, he is just a an outstanding comedian who is in demand for comedy clubs on television in so many different places and is really a very busy and hardworking uh, comedian and magician. And he had worked with uh, Tannen's Magic Camp and uh, has a great background in magic as well as being well-versed in comedy and doing script writing and everything then as well. I'm not going to get too much into this because this was just a, a fun conversation that we had with this particular conjurer for this particular week. So now it's time for me to introduce this particular guy. (laughs) So please welcome my friend, Mr. Harrison Greenbaum, here on The Magic Word. My guest today is someone that I've been wanting to talk with for a long time, but you will soon find out that he is one of the busiest and hardest working guys all around, all the time, it seems like. He was a summa cum laude graduate from uh, Harvard College, and actually he was a co-founder of the Harvard College Stand-Up Comic Society, or the acronym is uh, Harvard College Sucks, that's S-U-C-S, which is pretty funny. But he uh, moved from Boston to Manhattan, and he has been on a lot of uh, television shows, had 600 shows a year that he was doing comedy clubs, and as as they said, the New York Daily Times even called him the hardest working man in comedy. Comedy Central said he was one of the comics to watch. He had won the Andy Kaufman Award back in 2010. He has also been on television like America's Got Talent, NBC's Last Comic Standing, on Conan O'Brien's show, Comedy Central's show, and several other kinds of things, in addition to doing a lot of virtual online types of shows here in 2020. But not performing just not only in the U.S., but also having performed everywhere, including the uh, Sydney Opera House. That's a that's a big house to play for, I would, would say, as part of an, a national tour. And, of course, then has been a uh, comedy writer and someone who scripts a lot of his shows, if not all of his shows. But it seems like that he is best at improv, at least from what I've been around him. So please welcome my friend Harrison <laughs> Greenbaum. Hey, Harrison. Hey, thank you. I did a great job writing that bio. Wow. That yes. Was... <laughs> thank you. Did I leave anything out? <laughs> that, when, that, that's awesome that's uh yeah that, that's i think from the comedy section of my website there's a whole magic section ah yes well you're a funny guy and 
And I'm so excited about this, Scott. We we hung out. Uh, I think the last time we hung out was in Vegas. That's and right. So uh, this is this is exciting. I'm excited. And as I recall, that I was wanting to sit down and chat with you for your podcast, and you said, you know, I got to go across town. There's another guy wanting me to do a podcast on his show. It's like, okay, well, I will, I'll talk with you at another. Oh time. yeah, no, no, I had already <laughs> scheduled to literally get. I got in an Uber, went to somebody's podcasting studio on the other side of town in Vegas, and then had to Uber back in time to make another thing. It was like. The crazy that was one of the craziest convention schedules. I think I was on every show. I was about to say, I think they did have you on everything. And some of those were like last minute things you hadn't expected. Like I think you did the Matt King roast and you were kind of a last minute fill in and I so had you, fifteen minutes to prepare for the Matt King roast, which 15 is fifteen uh, minutes. Which is the most insane sort of comedy. Everything in comedy was leading up to that moment. Um I, I've done a lot of roasts. There's this thing called Roast Battle, which started in LA. Um, at the comedy store. And so I've been in Roast Battle as a competitor. I've judged Roast Battle in LA and New York, uh, and once in Hoboken, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. So I have a lot of experience with roasting. And I was also one of the youngest members of the Friars Club, which is, uh, sort of the home of the roast. Right. So I, I know what the format is and I've, I've written a ton of them. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm used to working sometimes in TV where you, where everything just has to move fast. You have to write jokes quickly. Um, you're on set and they need, you know, give us three jokes for this moment. Okay. Here, here's three, three ideas. So Mac came over to my table. Um, I was I was a guest at the roast. Um, he he and we were just talking. And he goes, "How come you're not doing this?" And I was like, "I would I would have loved to, Mac." And he's like, "Well, we got we got some dropouts. You should do it. Do you want you want to do it?" And I was like, "The roast starts. It's like seven forty five, I think. And the, the roast was at eight. Yeah, yeah. I was like, uh, I I mean I okay. I ha- I think I happen to have my laptop in my backpack because I'm one of those nerds that carries the whole convention in his backpack no matter where he is. So thank yeah. God they would have lost ten minutes just going back to my room in the Golden mm-hmm. Nugget. So I ran backstage with my laptop and I'm just pounding away. And uh, Michael Carbonero and Derek Hughes come backstage and they see me furiously typing and they're like, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "I'm on the roast. I'm I'm, I'm coming up with jokes." I go, "Is this even a good idea? Like you guys have been preparing for this for like for weeks if not months." And they both looked at me because I've known them for a long time. And they literally, basically at the same time, they're like, "You know, you want to do this. <laughs> There's no convincing you not to do this. This is this is what you want to do." And I was like, "Yeah, I do. I really want to do this." Um, but you so feel like was, that you were I, better at writing uh, last minute, kind of when you're under the gun like that, as opposed to what they had months in advance of preparation. Oh no, ideally I would have for something like that. I mean, I love Mac and and for yeah. roast jokes. You know, you kind of got to sit there and come up with as many jokes as you can. Like when I do a roast, I'll write 100, 200 jokes, and then I cut them down to the 15 best or the 10 best. Mm-hmm. And I'll run them by other comedians and say, are these the 10 best? And so I, I would have I, – ideally, there, you know, you do a long process. Um, but I was literally I, – I picked – the seat on the dais that I picked um, was the one that was closest to the off stage. And I had angled my body so that you couldn't see that I was typing the entire time the roast was happening. <laughs> so that's how I bought myself an extra 45 minutes of writing was I was writing while the rest of the roast was happening. <laughs> I know that some comedians, particularly like during a roast, who are on later, will take some of the things that have been said earlier on and kind of play on that. Well, so-and-so you know, was dressed like this tonight. Or he said, uh, we, you know, we found out that he you know, liked elephants or whatever. So you can kind of play on the immediacy and the the uh, being topical. And, yeah, and I was that that was the one good thing was I literally I, I'm sure it's obvious I would like turn around and look at somebody and like look them up and down and then start hearing seats <laughs> typing like okay I got it. I you got see it. what they were wearing. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've uh, seen a lot of those roasts as well and through the Friars Club. I'm trying to think what the gentleman's name is who is a roast master now. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Ross? That's him. Yeah. Jeff Ross, yeah. I- I'm assuming he's a friend of yours. I mean, I'm sure yeah, in the city that you yeah. just know a lot, and if not all the comedians around. Yeah, he's he's awesome. Um, the Friars Club is an interesting place to be at because there was it was mostly old Jews. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I, I'm, I'm an old Jew at heart, so I fit in perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> So they don't have a sauna in there. They kind of sit and oh, they do. They got do a they really? Oh my god! They all have a schwitz. Do a nice okay. schwitz. One time I had a schwitz, and then the best time to shave is like right after a good schwitz. I just wanted to say schwitz as many times. I want to have the record for most times saying schwitz on this podcast, and I think I've already done it. I, I believe so. I think if we've said schwitz in the last five hundred plus uh, episodes, it may have been once. So yeah, you would have uh, did it. Have all right. That. Congratulations! You get the honor. Uh, oh, I, but I, I get out of the I get out of the Schwitz. Now I'm just making sure the record's mine forever. Um, and I'm I'm shaving, and next to me is Len Cariou, who played the original Sweeney Todd. Oh wow! And there was something very surreal about shaving next to Sweeney Todd. 
<laughs> I was like, I better not cut myself. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> that is funny. I, I'm sure he's probably gotten that a lot. It's like, I remember so many years ago, I went to the Academy of Magical Arts banquet, and I was in the restroom, and one of the presenters, who was a celebrity, was in the stall standing next to me, and it was Buddy Ebsen. <laughs> and I wanted to say, doggies. <laughs> I'm very Uh, thankful. I mean, who knows where my career will go, but at the moment I don't have one of those like get her done catchphrases. I can only imagine it's very helpful for marketing, but has got to every time Larry the Cable Guy goes out to dinner, I'm sure somebody screams get her done. Get her done. Every waiter hands him the bill, get her done, and he's like, that cost you. That cost you on the tip. (laughs) That's a very good point. I think that there are things that you need to make sure whatever you're going to be having is something that you're going to be willing to live with quite literally and have it on your headstone. Yeah. I mean, I, I did, I did a gig with uh, JJ Walker in Atlantic city. Yeah. Uh, I think he charges the venue for him to say dynamite. He's like, he'll say it. Yes. But, but it costs. At this point, he's like, he knows you want it. So he, it's an upcharge. Yeah. Well, wow. That's interesting. So you might as well play to it. Uh, you yeah, know, fall into it. That's yes, right. <laughs> there are so many, uh, let's say, celebrities who would go on and uh, do movies or whatever, but they are still defined by what they had done earlier. For an example, let's say Drew Mary- Barrymore, who has now got her own t- daytime talk show, but she's been doing so much else. But still, people remember her from E.T., and she was saying in a recent interview about how that she had was st- still getting people who are reminding her of that, but it's getting fewer and fewer as she's having more and more of uh, accolades added onto her career. Yeah, I mean, I, I worked in the daytime morning space. I was the warm-up comic for Katie Couric's talk show mm-hmm. uh, called Katie, um, which was on ABC. And that was, what a weird job. Because <laughs> they were like, oh, yeah, you're going to warm up the audience. Um, you're going to get them, you know, then that's your job is get them, high, get, get them high up in energy, get them uh, ready to laugh and, you know, all that good stuff, get it ready for camera. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes the episodes would be very serious, but I would still come in. So there, so it was one of those like, are you ready to talk about colon cancer? Yeah, right after 9-11, like the next day, you're coming in, say, all right, people. It's so we did an episode. So, uh, we filmed the show. Oh, God, what was the It was the year of Hurricane Sandy, because I remember we had a Hurricane Sandy episode. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we wanted to be back in studio pretty, pretty quick. Um so the first episode, I was basically warming up uh, anybody in staff that didn't need to be on set. Yeah. So anybody who didn't need to be backstage doing something was in the audience trying to create an audience. So that was a very fun warm up because they've all heard my warm up before. They're there every day. Right. I'm just like, you guys know what you're doing, right? You're going to laugh for her. They're like, yes. I'm like, great. Yeah. You know what to do. I'm out of here. I'm going to get yeah, a cup exactly. of coffee. <laughs> Job done. All right. Cool. I'm going to get coffee. <laughs> I remember, I believe that Pat Hazel was the uh, warm-up for Ellen DeGeneres' show, which is kind of funny because years ago, it was it Showtime or HBO, I believe they were looking for the funniest person in America, and he had won for Nebraska, and she won for whatever state she was in, and they kind of went into the finals, and I think that he was, he and she kind of were in the battle of the best for the state uh, comedy spinoff or whatever, and she ended up winning, which I thought was kind of funny later that she'd hired him to be a warm-up. Again, I may be wrong, but I was thinking that he was doing some warm-up for her. He got, he's got to be thinking, man, if I only won that competition, the roles would be reversed. reversed yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, every day he wakes up, man, if I was just a little bit funnier during that competition. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. You had said to begin with what I was uh, reading off with some of the credentials that you had from your comedy side over there then, too. And I know that you went to uh, Tannen's Magic Camp, and w- you liked magic actually before that you had gone to camp. You just didn't go to camp because your parents wanted to get you out of the house for the summer, I'm sure. But... <laughs> well, I, my, my first love and, and first passion is magic, and I, I was five years old when I started doing magic. I was, a, you know, the magic kid in school. I was the kid who always had tricks. Um, and, and when I was, uh, I think I was 14, it was 2001, um, was the first year that I did, uh, the camp and it, it completely changed my life. Cause the one, the one thing that you, like when you're the only kid doing magic in your town, you're the best magician cause you're the only magician. only magician. Right. Right. So you don't know how bad you are until you go to a magic camp and you're like, Oh my God, these kids are incredible. So I, I needed that to realize there was like so much to learn. Um, and, and, and it was a nice little, uh, butt kicking the first year where I was like, oh, cause I walked in like, I'm going to win this competition. I have all of the easy to master card magics and I can do all of the tricks. Obviously I'm going to win. Sure. Um, and then you walk in, you're like, oh my God, there, there's a, 
people doing insane things. So that, that, and then there were friends I made that year uh, and the years after that are, are still my best friends to this day. My older son, Sean, was a football player in high school. He was a captain of the football team. And then when he went to play football in college in his freshman year, everybody who was on the team had been captains of their own. And so he was no right. big shot anymore. So similarly, he's kind of look around. These guys are a lot bigger than me, too. So <laughs> he was not as good as he thought that he was going to be because uh, everybody thought that they were great. But in uh, in, in Magic Camp, uh, I've never attended a Magic Camp. So what is the – I mean, I assume that they have – breakout sessions throughout the day where you're learning close-up and stage or do they focus on whatever your particular interest might be because you may be uh, into cardistry but you don't care about blocking and choreography and theater and vice versa uh yeah i mean it's it's, uh, it's all of that um so basically uh Tana's magic camp is uh 24 7 magic those kids wake up doing magic the only things on the schedule are magic um i, I think sorcerer safari has some camp activities like you can go to the pool and you can like play outside we are magic straight through um and and for the counselors when the kids go to bed around 10 or 11 um we that is the time for the counselors to then work on our own stuff with each other because you have this brain trust of some of the best magicians and we're all hanging out for a week so we want to be like hey let me let me run this idea by you uh, let me show you this um i've been thinking about this what do you think about this so from 11 to 4 a.m it's the counselor so for a counselor you're waking up at 8 a.m. and going to bed at 4 a.m. Wow. And it's all magic. Uh, but it, you, you start off the day with a class. The class is broken down, uh, beginner, intermediate, advanced, uh, in different categories. So you can be uh, an advanced close-up. You can be in beginner stage. Uh, and you're going to be in that class the whole week. Um, and depending on what level you are, if you're in a beginner level, you're probably going to learn a lot of the fundamentals. If you're in more advanced levels, you're going to learn. You might learn tricks, but you're also going to learn theory um, and putting it all into practice. Um and then in the workshop period, which is in the afternoon, the workshops are more specific. So you might take a business workshop. Um, you might take a kid show workshop. Um, I've been teaching a comedy workshop for a very long time. Um, and that's always really, really fun. Um, so that it's, it's, it's something that it's more, a more specific sort of uh, chunk. And then we have lectures every day. So you're getting a different lecture. There's a show every night. Um, there's a competition that's sort of threaded throughout the whole week. Um, so there's just, there's just tons of stuff. Are the shows in the evenings by the students, or are they from out outside performers, or the instructors, or all the above? It's outside performers and counselors, um, hmm. and they're insane. Some of the shows you're like, I can't believe this is the lineup. Like this is nuts. And they do bring in people, I assume, as you say, to lecture or something. They just may be there for the day. They're not going to be there for the entire. Week. Yeah, some people, some people literally come in, lecture, leave. Some people crash for a day or two. It's it's whatever you know. It's 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 a pretty flexible thing. And then. Uh, I, I've been there. This, this, I did the virtual camp this year, so this was my 20th year at camp. 15, I heard that this one was just down. crazy. In 2020, they had like a thousand or children, uh, youth or something. Yeah, I did a comedy workshop for the kids via Zoom, and it was just crazy. I mean, we we were talking about comedy, and then I realized, you know, I had a kid there from South Africa. There's a kid from Norway. Mm -hmm. I mean, a totally global audience. So we were able to reach kids we might not have been able to reach had we, you know, been physically in Pennsylvania. Yeah, unlike anything ever before, I'm sure. And because that it was virtual, I assume it was – well, I don't assume. It, what was the pricing on that? I Was it less or about the same as what it typically is? It was is? free, which uh, wow. Adam Lutenthal ran the Tannins. Uh, God bless him. Um, it was a it was an crazy, crazy endeavor, and it was really a gift for her, all the I, – I mean, uh, you – if I was a kid and that was my magic camp, virtual magic camp experience, I would have freaked out. Copperfield was there, Teller was there, Darren Brown, uh, mm -hmm. Carbonara. I mean, it was every major name you'd ever want to meet, I think, uh, and more. And yeah, Adam did it for free. Um, to, to I, I, you know, and I think it was something that was really good for the kids who were involved. And are the camps typically for a week, or is it like a month, or they run throughout the summer, and every week they change to out different kids? Uh, yeah, no, it's just one week. We do okay. one week and then I collapse. So I, I you know, I, I uh, my parents knew and now my girlfriend know the day after camp, I'm just going to sleep straight. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get home. I'm going to collapse and I will not be conscious for 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. I don't think they have the Sorcerer Safari anymore. I was speaking with the uh, uh, curator of that a while back and I believe they had uh, disbanded the the camp when was that? Probably 2016, 17, 18, somewhere in there, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I it's they they uh I think they're in Canada too. Correct. Um, 
So tannins is the only one that's really an ongoing concern at this point, as far as I know. And it's been going for on for, for decades, I think uh, 30, 40 years. Right. Well, speaking of tannins, did you ever, I assume you did, used to go to Cutcher's into the... Uh, so I never t- made it out to the Jubilee, yeah. um, but I went to Cutcher's uh, for my senior high school trip. That was where they took us okay. to celebrate, because I, I grew up in Long Island. So the seniors at Lawrence High School got to go to Cutcher's for a weekend, which is a weird place to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, the joke about the food. Uh, the food is terrible, but such big portions. Yeah. Uh, so it was uh, – or I guess the joke is uh, – the, com- the, the complaint about Cutcher's. The food's terrible in such small portions. But it was they gave us a lot, they gave us a lot of, of terrible food. Uh, but I remember being like, whoa, I'm in the Catskills. And I knew enough about – comedy and like I was I'm a big Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner you know I love uh, the 2000 year old man was like the, my, my favorite thing listening to favorite mm-hmm. cassette listening to growing up so I I was like I really want to be able to say I performed at the Catskills uh so I, I managed to get like a magic performance snuck into the schedule at Kutcher's while we were there for my senior trip and I did like a 15 minute performance but I have the printout because Kutcher's has that like daily scheduled activities yeah so I can say that I performed in the Catskills at Kutcher's Resort. Your name is there. <laughs> I basically did card tricks in the lobby, but I can say <laughs> that I did. I was at Catskills uh, in the Borscht Belt. Do they still have uh, that kind of circuit anymore as far as, I mean, I know the comedy club circuit is nothing, of course, like what it was. And I know that the Borscht Belt circuit is nothing like it was, but I assume that from time to time they still bring in some outside entertainers. I think most of the hotels are condemned. I think, mm, okay. uh, or, or should be. I think most of them are are demolished. I because I, I, I I don't know if Kutcher's itself is still open, but I know there was a lot of them that had been like just closed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, it's it's not quite what it what it what it was. Yeah, for people who watch the marvelous Miss Maisel, and, and that is right. a, a point in time that is just a wonderful series, and you kind of get to see what that's like there too. And my dad was a waiter in the Casco. Really? Like it, it wasn't that. It, it was only one generation ago that it was still like a place to to go and mm-hmm. and the hot the hot ticket for for Jews in New York. <laughs> so with the, uh, that having closed, they didn't want to pay for air conditioning. They thought it was cheaper to just drive into the mountains. Or it was cooler. Cooler in the evenings up there. That's right. Yeah, it's slightly open. cooler. We'll just drive for three hours and uh, get a bungalow. That was my favorite. It was always a bungalow. I've never heard that word used except for Jews going to the cats because, oh, I've rented a bungalow. <laughs> well, I think it's also – You say cabin. The non-Jews stay in cabins, but we stay in a, in a bungalow. Bungalow. It's, <laughs> it sounds more impressive. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, we have bungalows. My grandmother stayed next to my, my grandparents, who's Holocaust survivors, European immigrants, amazing. They lived next to uh, a couple. They were like, wow, these, uh, I, I think they're like, these sisters are very friendly. They're very friendly sisters, and uh, they love rainbows, which is just a beautiful thing. These rainbow loving sisters were like, Grandma, I, I don't think they're sisters. <laughs> They spend a lot of time with each other. They love each other. They're they're very. But they don't really look a lot alike. Yeah. <laughs> they're genes. They do things I don't think sisters are supposed to do to each other. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the term of a shotgun house? No. That sounds like a shotgun marriage. And not really. It's a, a smaller house, I guess. Some well, kind of like a bungalow, I guess. It's a small thing in which that the idea is that you could shoot a shotgun in the front door and it will the buckshot will go out the back door without hitting anything. <laughs> it's just kind of long and narrow and not a lot in between you've got your bedroom living room and kitchen and everything else but basically it's just yeah it's what they call them shotgun houses it, it's a term that they use here in texas for some places i can think of two reasons jews would not live in a shotgun house <laughs> one being we do not have shotguns but second of all we'd be complaining about the drafts we're big we're an anti-draft people and i and by draft i mean the wind kind uh <laughs> not going to war i drafts people uh <laughs> if, if there's a way for for wind to for somebody to go in the front door and out the back door there's going to be a draft and we're not part of it <laughs> <laughs> well you're talking about keeping cool and driving up the mountains so i was thinking about whenever that you know the kind of air conditioning you'd have would be like a 250 air conditioning where you have two windows down and going 50 miles an hour so that way you... <laughs> Keep cool that way, <laughs> certainly. I want to talk about, a little bit about uh, scripting also that uh, for Magic. And obviously you said that you were teaching a class then uh, for the youth. But uh, I, I know when I've heard you speak many times at uh, conventions uh, and you will 
talk a little bit about scripting and the importance of um, uh, making sure you're knowing what you're going to be saying and doing before you go out, even though it may seem to be unscripted. And you can kind of go down an improvisational line with certain people in the audience and whatever, but you, but that's a skill that I guess can be taught. But um, but you first of all have to have an idea of where you're going. Right, exactly. You can't go off-roading if you don't have a map. If you don't have a map, which is the script, and you go off-road, you don't know how to get back onto the road eventually. Ah, good point. So for me, like knowing knowing all of my lines really well is is the reason I could uh, throw all the lines away if I have to. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's really you have to have a plan so you can throw it away. That that's the idea. So you have a script, and also the script is there to say, hey, I I want to have a baseline level of entertainment that is great. Um, so even if even if the audience isn't giving me a lot to work with, I have jokes that are, are built in that will work. Um, and so you're, you're making sure that there's a structure to what you're doing. Um, and then f- from that base, you can then have fun. I mean, there were moments my, my, my show is set up to give me moments of interaction with the audience that I can then plug into the script. Um, you know, I, I worked with Susie Essman um, a, a bunch. She's from Curb Your Enthusiasm. And one of the best pieces of advice she ever gave was um, you have to justify why they're coming to see you live. If you're just doing the same show every single night, they might as well just buy the video. Um, you you want to you want to do something in your show, and you want your show to be present and and in the moment, um, and acknowledge the audience that's there. That's why they're coming to see you live, and not just you know watching your special on Netflix. Yeah, I you made a good uh, point over there that on Curb Your Enthusiasm, when she was working with Larry David, as I understand the way that that show is scripted, they have a general outline and a few jokes and the rest of it is pretty much improvisational. Is that true? Yeah. I think he has like a brief outline so they know where the story has to go and then they just kind of roll. And it's one of the reasons the dialogue, like one of the things that I love about Curb is the characters laugh at each other's jokes, Mm -hmm. which you never see. Like when you, you, in Friends, Chandler is constantly coming up with very funny lines to cut down everybody else. And if he was in a normal group of friends, they would all then laugh. If they didn't, uh, that friend would be like a sociopath that he's just making <laughs> constant jokes that nobody likes and never stopping. And no one ever tells him like, Shannon, we haven't laughed for nine years. Why are you still making these jokes? It is literally sociopathic behavior. You cannot be in our friend group. So it's nice to see in Curb that like if somebody makes a joke, the other characters laugh like in real life. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Whenever they're walking down the street and someone's saying something or in a restaurant, yeah, they are, they are chuckling. That, that's a very good point. So, what are your tips or outline that you would suggest when someone is trying to write a script, particularly for a magic show? It seems like it, again, you have to introduce your character. I think the first thing is whenever you're walking on stage, people need to love you and you need to break that fourth wall as soon as you can, and then get into a trick later. I'm thinking, for an example, like Bob Reed would do a 20-minute show, and it wouldn't be until 18 minutes in, he would produce the bottle from a silk or something. But he's done 18 minutes of comedy, and he keeps kind of leading up to this, saying, well, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're going to show you something great. But first, in the, or, or uh, Billy McComb and others who just had great conversation that would introduce their character. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what, what are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, so the lecture that I've been giving now for years is called You Are All Terrible. Um, and it's, it's me trying to make magic less terrible. Because the problem in magic is that we have a lot of cover bands. There's a lot of people hmm. doing, you know, tricks they didn't create with scripts they didn't write um, based on acts they saw somebody else do. And then they're like, that's art. Um, you, you can, like, it, it, a magi- there's a lot of magicians who are essentially doing Beatle, Beatles covers, but then acting like they're John Lennon. Um, you're a cover band, and that's fine if you want to be a cover band, but know that that's what you are. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the key is originality. Um, and the reason I think magicians get in trouble is because we're perhaps the only artists that create backwards, and we shouldn't be. Um, but I use the example of a painter. So if a painter wants to, to paint, he'll be like, you know what, I want to paint the sky. I'm going to paint a beautiful thing in the sky. And then he, and if he's Picasso, it won't look like the sky. It'll be some weird rendering of the sky. If it's Monet, it'll be this gauzy. You, as soon as you say the painter's name, you kind of know sort of what his mm-hmm. approach might be because he has a distinct point of view that he has when he paints or, or she or, um, or they. But, um, the, they start with the idea, I'm going to paint the clouds. Then they go out and they start to determine the techniques that they need or the paints that they need or, um, am I going to do it on a canvas? Am I going to paint it on glass? Am I going to paint it on something weird? Am I going to paint it on cardboard? Uh, then they paint it. Um, in my lecture, the joke, I show a Bob Ross painting of clouds. I'm like, the artist is Bob Ross and the technique is marijuana. 
Um, that's, that's Bob Ross's technique. <laughs> but in magic, we do the opposite. We, we start with the technique. We buy the trick and we go, how do I jam this into my act? And at that point, I feel like you've lost the game. Good point. Um, you're never going to be able to push that trick far enough away from the, from what, what it was to, ma- to make it really feel original. Like a real artist comes up with an idea and then they figure out how to do it. And it's, I think it's really freeing. Um, it's a really fun process. Um, I think it's how every magician that I like does it. Um, all, you know, all the big greats, um, they, you know, you sit there and you go, okay, what should happen in my show? I will write the script to a trick before I know the method. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Cause mm-hmm. I know I will come up with a method. I, I know that eventually I will figure out a way to do it. There's a way to do each trick. I might have to modify the script cause I'm not a wizard. <laughs> I, I always, I always say that, especially when I'm like, uh, if I'm teching something with like TV people or theater people who don't know magic, I always use that line where I'm like, and then we have to do this because I'm not a wizard. <laughs> if you turn the lights up, they'll see the thread because I'm not a wizard. Um, th- but, yeah, you come up with this, the ideal dream script. It would be really funny if this happened. So I'm a comedian magician. I'm a comedy magician. So, uh, or I always describe myself as a comedian who does magic. But funny is the first thing for me. Is what would be the funniest thing that could happen? What's the funniest version of that script? Um, my fu trick um, was a script first. I, I thought it was a very funny idea. Um, and since kids are listening, I won't get too much in detail. But I wrote the <laughs> jokes about it. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, I now need a method to have this card that has a sticker on it. And then I have to peel it off. And it has to be the card that was just randomly said out loud. Mm-hmm. And then I had to go, oh, my God, how do you do that? <laughs> and I and I sat in my apartment and I came up with multiple different methods. Um, and that and, and that, ending up in, in, in increasingly impossible positions. Yeah. And then you just and then the other fun thing is because the idea is what's motivating everything. Sometimes. uh there's a cleaner method from a magical perspective. We're like, Oh, this is the cleverest method, but it doesn't help my presentation. So like I I'm, you know, the prop that you pick has to be the prop that matches the idea the best. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a, there's a million different, uh, I I don't want to give away. Well, there's people who Google me and then they're like, Oh, that's the prop he uses in that thing. You have to make, I always tell magicians when they write their set list, don't put the name of the trick. Right. Uh, cause somebody's mm. gonna find it backstage and now they can Google every trick that you have. Like, first of all, it should not be even that. It should, like, when I talk about one of my tricks in my act, I call it the Snuggie trick. Cause for everybody who sees that trick, it's the Snuggie trick. Um, it's, it has elements in it. Um, but that's, for me, in my head, uh, you know, oh, that's the baby trick. The same reason um, that you wouldn't use, uh, called sponge balls the name that they are, whatever kinds of things. Yeah, if you're, if you're in your set silk. list, just write, if all you can write, come up with when you're coming up with your set list, the name of that trick is Spongebob, it's probably not a great presentation. <laughs> but that's the most salient thing about the trick yeah. is the prop itself. Yeah. It's probably, it probably shouldn't even be on that set list. Start all over. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you're doing a thing with spirit slates, for example, there's a bunch of different m- manufactured versions of spirit slates. And there's there's a million ways you can make it, different materials. Sure. Um, the key is not necessarily picking the one that is easiest to use or requires. Sometimes there, you know, sometimes the method is the easiest method. Sometimes it's the most technically hard method. But my choice is always from the idea, not from from oh, okay, this is the easiest. This is going to be the easiest one for me to do. It's whatever look, whatever fits my idea the most. I'm willing to put the work in. Um, if that's what makes the idea sing the best. Mm-hmm. I think that's pretty wise, certainly, is to figure out yeah, the presentation and then kind of work the method that would, regardless of how much time and effort that it might take to actually learn that method. And I've trapped myself, by the way. Like I, For my Snuggie trick, you know, it's very, it's very easy for me to write in my notebook. And then a Jewish star lights up in the Snuggie. Because <laughs> I go, can your Snuggie do this? And then I wanted the lights to go out, right. and like Iron Man when he has the like the white circle in his chest. His chest, right. I right. wanted there to be like a glowing Jewish star on my chest that maybe like would blink in time to the music. That that's what I wrote in my my dream script. Yeah. If I knew that three to five second bit in my show would cost me hours, if not days, of my life just building the thing, I've gone yeah. through a million versions. I've had to source materials, and then every venue I get to, I have to tech that moment. So that's at least 10 to 15 minutes where I have to say, so there's this three-second three bit. 
where the lights are going to go completely down and we need to make sure that this reads. If I, you know, if, if you wrote right to say, okay, this bit, is this bit going to be funny? I don't know. It's going to cost me 15 minutes every show for the rest of my life. Plus all the time it takes to build and maintain it. <laughs> I might've not put it in the notebook, but the idea was strong. I was like, I have to do that idea. It is a strong idea and it is memorable as well. I certainly remember that piece and it does stand out from any of the rest of the routine and from anyone else who's doing something. So it's making it uniquely yours. And because of the time and trouble that it takes, it, a lot of times magicians won't go to the extra trouble. For example, years ago that uh, Martin Lewis's uh, cardiographic kind of a thing, well, you had to make the thing. And even though that he taught you how to do it, that there's a lot of construction and everything involved. And a lot of magicians says, well, you know, if I can't buy it and perform it immediately, I don't want it. So because there are some, some things involved with trying to uh, get the thing to work. And I was one That's of like a perfect example, by the way, for you are all terrible. If you're just doing cardiographic and the only jokes you do are you draw the card and you yeah. say, oh, is that not your card? And then you draw it as a box and you go, ah, uh? if you're just doing that out of the package, you, you are you are a cover band. <laughs> That's not your routine. Um, you can think about that method. Um, you know, there's some really Martin Lewis is a, is is brilliant. That yeah. routine has so many cool things. But I wish we lived in a world of magic where only one person did cardiographic and that was, you know, and and that was associated with that person. And and somebody else would maybe you can use similar methods or like the ideas that Martin has come up with to to figure that, you know, having that in the back of your head can be useful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's another guy who did a thing where he draw like it drew like essentially a horse. It was like a very generic horse. Yeah. And he's like think of an animal. And then it was the giraffe and the neck grew. Right. Same method. Um, I, you know, it worries me if, if he was holding the cardiographic pad and was like, what else can I do with it? Oh, giraffe, that neck goes up. But if somebody was thinking to himself, oh, I really want to do a trick with animals, and then cardiographic came to his mind after he had written the script, then that, that, that would be a good application. I see what you're saying, yeah. Well, another idea, I remember Joe Given doing and seeing him do this several years ago where it was a bowl of alphabet soup. And that the letters rearrange themselves into making a prediction or the name of something. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you do mm -hmm. sort of the reverse. You kind of take something away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the whole point of you you should, you can buy tricks in, ter in terms of learning how they work so that you have a file cabinet in your head of secrets. Mm -hmm. So that when you write that script, you can, like, uh, so I'm the virtual, one of the virtual shows that I'm doing is called Scam Online, the Society of Conjurers and Magicians. It's very secret, very, it's the oldest magic society in the world very old and very real um mm -hmm. if you think it's not real then it's working uh, <laughs> our website is please don't visit this website.com please don't visit this website.com it says don't in it so clearly and please and yet you will i don't know how that works um <laughs> but uh basically every week for scam um uh patrick my co-host and i have had to invent a magic trick <laughs> Um, and it always starts with the idea. We always sit there and we go, what would be a really funny thing to do on the show, especially fitting in with the theme of that week's episode. And then once we've come up with the idea, then we have to figure out, oh my God, what method do we know that can achieve that? What technique do we know? And having that really big file cabinet definitely makes that easier. We, you know, you come up with the method, you go, okay. Like I came up with this idea and I, this is me coming up with an idea without a method. Because we were exhausted. I think we were episode, I don't know, I want to say 15 or 16 in, and every single week we had to invent a magic trick. We had gone through all the material from our regular act mm -hmm. and adapted it for the show. And then we're like, oh, my God, we need to start creating material because, we, we, you know, it has to be original material. And uh, so we got it. We were exhausted. And I said, that's the maybe that's that's the trick is we're exhausted. We're tired of inventing tricks every week. So we'll tell the audience. We don't want to invent a trick this week. You have to invent the trick for us. We're not going to do any of the work. And so we're just going to lay out weird objects on in each one of our apartments and let the audience choose the weird object. And we'll have to improvise a trick from the objects that the audience will choose. And then I realized, because it was um, oh, it was episode 13. That's why the number 13 is important. I was like, no, one of them is if the, uh, they pick three objects. And those are the only three objects that, according to the bylaws of scam, would mm -hmm. bring about bring about the actual apocalypse. <laughs> and so we they pick the three objects. We're about to start a trick with them. And we go, oh, my God, 
oh my god, Patrick, do you have the rules for scam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember rule 13? And we show it to camera and it's circle and it says, if you combine objects A, B, and C, the world will end. And we're like, oh my god, we almost, we narrowly escaped the apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. So we wrote that whole script. We did not have a method for how do you make the rules? It, 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 we realize it's a prediction effect, right? We, we realize, okay, we're going to have to have a set of rules that is the prediction of the three objects, three random audience members are going to choose off of our screens. And we, we went through a lot of different methods in, in a day of what, <laughs> and we had, you know, and having a deadline in that case was helpful, being under pressure where we're like, we're going live at eight o'clock on Thursday. So we better have a method and it better work. And have you practiced that online with someone else? In other words, do you do a practice Zoom meeting or something, I guess, with uh, we some don't get to do audience? It with a live audience. For for scam stuff, it is we are coming up with the by the time the episode is over, we're exhausted and then we have to start thinking about the next trick. So by the time all of the pieces come together, um, it it is often um, the first time we're using real people, so we're practicing it with each other and we have, we have a script. Um, but yeah, it's just such a weird way to work too, because I'm so used to running a thing to death before mm-hmm. it ever gets on video of any kind. You know, running a trick thousands of times, doing 600 shows a year. So that that thing is a polished, just like I know Machine. every way the thing could go wrong. This is a creative exercise where we're gonna bring, you know, there's no way to have nobody has 22 camera ready full routines that fit with the theme of a show. So we're going to have to start coming up with stuff and, and really rely on our experience as performers um, to come up with these unique things. I think you've hit on a lot of really great points and topics over there, and one of them has to do with uh, having a great background and knowledge of magic and effects. It's one of the most uh, challenging and fun things I like to do are working in trade shows because once that I find out about the company and what it is they're trying to sell, uh, whether it's uh, something that they make or something uh, intellectual property or whatever it might be, then I will start to try to figure out a trick that I can use as an example to bring people into the booth basically to talk about that product or service. And so it's it's just reverse engineering as opposed to having a trick and then trying to force that into saying, you know, like uh, linking rings. Well, this ring represents quality and service and whatever else. I mean, that's too easy and obvious. But just the other way around, what is it that they actually make or do or they're trying to sell? And what kind of a product can I use, to, or rather a trick, to try and sell that product? I remember that Dan Garrett, for an example, had a good idea where he was talking about, I think it was Wi-Fi or using Bluetooth with some company, and he was doing 3Fly so that you could see that it would actually, the packets of information would vanish here and reappear over in the other hand, so it would go invisibly through the air through your Bluetooth or whatever years ago. Different things like that where that you actually take an idea that you know and work that into the product or service. And so the same thing, I guess, what you're talking about is trying to develop a um, uh, a routine into um, uh, something that might work with the humor, of this topical or whatever the direction you're going with uh, with your script. Yeah, and and it's freeing. Like that's why I always yeah. want people to do it. Is it's so freeing because you're sitting down and you go, you you know, I have my kids at Magic Camp. I'm like, close your eyes and just picture yourself doing your dream show. What hmm. What's happening in your dream show? Did you just like fly around the room? You could do that. With enough money and time, you could absolutely fly around the room. Um, mm-hmm. Do you, you know, in your show, does your costume change instantly? We, we can, there is somebody at this camp who can tell you how that can happen. Um, so you start with the dream idea and then you're not restricted by what you have in your closet or what the latest release is. Uh, and you're not trying to go like, okay, I own color match. How do I put color match in my show? Yeah, you, you, that that already is putting too many too many restrictions. It's a very good point. Yeah, a lot of times that you will buy a trick and then try to figure out a routine. Well, in a way, I did that some years ago, a long time ago, when I bought my, a sub trunk and it sat there for four years before I actually performed it for an audience because I was trying to find the right music. And I think that it does take time sometimes, as opposed to having music and then buying the trick and being ready for it. But I mean, but it sounds like you had the, you knew what the routine was going to be. You just didn't know the music to it. You knew you wanted to do something in that that world. That's right. 
And so, which meant the choreography was going to have to change then a little bit once that I got the right music, because my wife and I had rehearsed that, and we knew what to do and how to do it and, and whatnot, but it was just a matter of trying to find the right music at the right time, so this way we can put this all together with the timing that would fit to kind of what we were wanting to do with it. So I kind of bought the, well, I did about the trick first, and then work it into, um, found something that would fit for it. Yeah. Well, I always, you know, I, I, this was a joke that I have in my lecture where I always go, you know, I go, what you will not see in this in this lecture. I always say, you know, I spoke to your wife and she said, you have enough. Shit. Uh, <laughs> you have enough. Mag- you probably have a garage full of magic stuff. You're not going to buy your way into your dream. You're not going to go, oh, I'm just one magic purchase away from being the magician I've always wanted to be. <laughs> you have enough stuff to be the magician you want to be already. You just have to put the work in. And, and something I alluded to when I talked about the difference between artists is we should know who you are. That's another thing. Most magicians, most magicians, their character, you know, being, being a magician is not a character being, you know, I I'm a magician is not a character statement. Okay. We should know who you are as a performer. There's so many magicians at the end of their show. I know nothing about them. I know nothing about them. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a good comedian or any artist that you like, you you could you, sometimes a good artist are like I could, I could be friends with that person because I know details about that person, I know what they like, I know how they think. Um, maybe you disagree with how that person thinks, but you, you, that person has sort of opened them, opened their chest op- up and showed them your you know showed you their heart. But sometimes and that character that might back. be a little bit different than what their real life might be. In other words, that I. There are some performers that are great and think, oh, boy, I want to hang out with that person. And then when you get to know them, it's like, eh, it's not quite the, the person, the persona that I see on stage or, or well, vice yeah, you're versa. Either, you're either going to make a completely invented character like Sylvester the Gesture is not uh, right. the Italian man who plays him. Um, <laughs> he's, he's just a, he's a normal guy in real life, but he's a cartoon in, in, the, in you know, Rudy Kobe is not Lab Man. Yeah. Um, but the other version of the character, your Copperfields, your Matt King. Matt King is a, it's a magnified version of yourself. You pick the parts of yourself that you would like to magnify and exaggerate. Um, I always say it's, it's a superhero version. If you're Clark Kent, who's Superman? Um, mm-hmm. So when I go on stage, I'm the person on stage is a bigger, better version of me. It's the person that I, I, it might, I, I want to say I wish I could be that person, but if I was that person off stage, it might be obnoxious because it would be very loud and very big the whole time. So I probably you probably would not want that in a romantic dinner is stage Harrison to be there. Um, but stage Harrison is uh, is 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 the superhero version of myself. I'm trying to amplify uh, things that things that uh, uh, that are about me. So when you see that person, you're seeing things that link to my real life. You're seeing you're seeing how I feel, what I think, um, my opinion on stuff um, that that's all coming through. I think you answered a question I was about to ask, and that is how you find your character, and particularly when you are talking to youth like that or those who might be listening to this. They're still trying to find themselves, certainly. They're at an age in which that they're trying a little bit of everything, and they don't know who they are. They haven't identified with their onstage persona, and there are a lot of adults who still haven't quite figured that out, and so they're bouncing from trick to trick. Like you said, that's why that we have that insatiable desire to continue to buy something else to stick in our drawers and not use again. You know, yeah, one of the saddest things is we see a show where <clears throat> the magician's character changes every trick because it's the character of the person who wrote or invented that trick. Oh, good point. So, like, they bought a trick from a comedy magician, and then they bought a trick from a uh, a serious mentalist. magician, and yeah. the character, and then they bought one from a mentalist. So all of a sudden, they went from their Lance Burden, then their Max Maven, then their Mac King in one show, and you're like, that's not. Yeah. A character is a character can have dimension, so you don't have to be the same note the whole time, but. It should all be connected to something. Um, and also, if you're a kid, you don't even know who you are. It's hard to be. It's hard to amplify things about yourself when you don't know who you are. I, mm-hmm. I, I didn't know who I was when I was 14. I still don't necessarily know 100 percent who I, I don't. I don't think anybody ever fully knows themselves. Mm-hmm. But it, it was a very long process. If you're an adult, at, at a certain point, you are you are re- responsible for figuring out your character. You can no longer say, I don't know what my character is. You, you know. Yeah. Your, your your significant other could probably write an essay on who you are. That's a good point. That you should be listening to other people because they may see you as a different character than what you think you are. In other words, you might think you're suave and debonair, or that you're a comedy guy, and you're just the opposite of whatever. And so you need to to embrace whatever the character is that the how the audience sees you. Yeah, you need to be honest. I I have a slide in my lecture. It's a Venn diagram. Your character mm-hmm. is at the intersection of your perception of who you are with uh others perception of who you are 
Uh, and you can either choose to have them match or be in opposition. Um, if, you know, the, the worst version of it is where you see just some fat, disgusting magician who thinks he's sexy, mm-hmm. acting sexy. That's bad. Um, if he's aware that he's acting at, uh, at the opposite of how people perceive him, and that's a comedy act where he looks, he looks terrible, but he's, he acts like he's awesome. Right. That can be very funny. Um, Judah Friedlander is the world champion, but he, he's purposely a slob. Like, you see him and you go, he's not the world champion. So him saying he's the world champion at the opposite of how he looks and acts, right. that, that, that's a funny conflict. Um, but you, you have to be, you have to be honest with yourself and, and be okay with the, okay, this is how people see me. You need to embrace that. That's true. I remember hearing Jason Alexander, who played on Seinfeld, uh, Costanza, George Costanza, and he was saying that when he was getting involved, he wanted to be the leading actor. He wanted to be like David Copperfield and flowing hair and wind machine and all that kind of stuff, but realized early on when the agents were saying, no, you'd play, be better playing like Falstaff in the Shakespeare play. You know, you're more of a a character, a comedy character, and you need to embrace that. So he thought eventually had to take a hard look in the mirror and realize, okay, I'm short, bald, wear glasses, and perhaps I'm not going to be the type of George Clooney leading actor, and so I need to embrace this type of character and been extremely successful with it. Yeah, and also like, there, there, there's the impression test. Can you do an impression of of that person? If you can do an impression of that person and everybody else knows who you're doing an impression of, that person probably has a solid character. That's a very good point. That, yeah. You know, if you're Matt King, you, Southern draw from Kentucky, and you do the impression in the afternoon, then you know. <laughs> uh, <Howdy. laughs> yeah, exactly. That's all you need. And you're like, okay, that's Matt. Um, yeah. So it's like, it, that's, it, it's so easy to, um, yeah, you, it seems easy in retrospect. As soon as you see a Matt King or a Lance Burden, um, you're like, man, I know exactly who that character is. That took that guy years to get there. Uh, but once you get there, it becomes a lot easier too to to figure out material that fits for your character and 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 ask yourself. You know, when I interviewed uh, Steve Cohen on Who Books That, which is my other weekly show, uh, every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Uh, Who Books That for the International Brotherhood of Magicians on Facebook. Um, shameless plug. Uh, Schwitz. I was making sure the record's still there. Uh, <laughs> Schwitz. Schwitz. Um, but Steve Cohen's character is the millionaire's magician, right. and and in talking to him, it was interesting because he sat down with uh with Mark Levy. Uh, and they created the character of the millionaire's magician and they spoke about the millionaire's magician in third person for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Would the millionaire's magician do this? And now it's funny because in the interview I said, are, is Steve Cohen and the millionaire's magician, are they starting to blend? Like is real life Steve Cohen becoming more like the millionaire's magician? Uh, and, and it is, but at the beginning, uh, it was a full on character, um, that he created and, and funneled his, his creative vision through. And that's, that was a solid choice. It, it, you can, his costume choice, where he performs, the tricks he performs, all of those make sense to, to that character. Whit Hayden's another one in which the, he changed his name from Whit Hayden to Pop Hayden. And so he has a legend. He has a background that he talks about his character that uh, was a time traveling village that he was part of. And, he, and I did a podcast episode with him and it was just phenomenal that although that a lot of the things that he has in his legend uh, are not ever brought to the fore during his show, but he knows that this is the character he should he where, he, where he's coming from, basically so that in his mind, this is how a person would normally react. I remember talking with, oh, the fellow who was an heir to Ian Fleming. I can't remember his name right now, who was actually a mentalist at one point. There's a long story involved with this, but uh, I was talking with him once about James Bond. He said, I think I have maybe one more James Bond novel left in me, and the reason that I don't think that we can do many more of these because between Ian and myself that we have pretty much explored every nuance and avenue of what James Bond would do. So the reader knows that if he's placed in this situation in a nest of bees or when he's with his <laughs> villain or whatever it's going to be, they know probably how he's going to be getting out of it because that he has done this before somehow or another over a period of time and how he's going to win, basically. Uh, and so he said that we don't want to be anticlimactic. So that's way that the reader will anticipate what's going to happen. But he's gotten to be so nuanced that everybody knows all the nuances of that person but you have to live and breathe that character when you're on stage so that even though again you're not bringing in 
all of, let's say, that time travel or whatever, like in Witt's case or Pop Hayden's case, but you know where he's coming from. He knows where he's coming from, so yeah. he knows the next step what and what he would say and how he would react to situations when someone would say something to him. And secrets are really funny. Like, I was helping a friend come up with a character, and he could do a really good, like, old miner voice, like a, a gold prospect. I'm an old gold prospector. <laughs> and like, when was it that character did magic? And I just said, what is if he killed his wife? And he and nobody knows it, but he's very bad at keeping that secret. And so it goes from old mining character, which could be funny watching. Oh, look at my old gold pieces traveling around the map mm-hmm. to um, hello. Why don't you come on stage? Oh, you remind me of my wife. I miss her. I mean, I, we don't know where she is. She's been missing. Uh, <laughs> and it, he keeps leaking that she's dead. You know, he takes out a handkerchief. It's covered in blood and he like throws it to the side. All of a sudden, this character has this extra dimension that's so much funnier right. to play than just, you know, old mining prospector. Right. He has a background and a story that might be more interesting you'd like to follow, but they're not. he's not going to take you down that path, but that's one you could go. <laughs> yeah, and if you're willing to put yourself on stage, you're a three-dimensional person. Yeah. So if you're willing to show different facets of yourself while you're on stage, it's going to have a dimensionality that it wouldn't have if you didn't present. But I, I, when I was in college, um, so my, the Harvard College Stand Up Comic Society, Harvard College Sucks, um, we would, but I would, I, we, I would go on MySpace, which was the, the social network at the time. Mm-hmm. And I would message comedians that I liked if I knew they were going to be in Boston and say, Hey, Harvard will give you an award. And by that, I mean, I will print you out a certificate that says <laughs> the Harvard College Stand Up Comics Society. Um, if you come to, to campus and hang out with us essentially and, and, and talk to us about comedy. And, uh, Mike Birbiglia said, okay, sure. So he came, we had lunch with Mike. There was like eight of us and we were asking for advice. I'll never forget it. He said, doing really good comedy should feel like ripping scabs off like that. It should be so personal. It hurts. Hmm. And the, the, like the next weekend I started doing jokes about my sexuality. Cause I never talked about that on stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, talking about perception of uh, your perception, audience perception. Um, he's like, do jokes that would be awkward for your parents to see. That was his other piece of advice. I was like, that's such good advice. Like, it should be so personal that, like, maybe even your parents don't know about it, but now these strangers in yeah. this theater do. Um, and that's uh, that, that's something that you see in comedy all the time. Uh, but we should have more of that in magic. You should be like, wow, I, that guy literally, like, let us see into who he is. I've heard, she is, is. I've heard Penn Jillette talk about that, and that is that you're just not going to be saying, hey, look at the pretty box. There needs to be something that is going to be emotional that the, that the audience is brought into and understands and likes or hates about you but they now know more about you and i was wondering uh, in your opinion on how much that you think that you should as a magician be telling them and yet still be entertaining what i have found for myself is there's a gypsy thread routine that i might end with in which i'm talking about my life and going to school and my family moving away getting married and kids and grandkids and my wife passing and one thing or another but everything's in the strands of life and everything comes back together that you know you want to have all this time together that means something and so afterwards people will come to me so this way that they feel like that they know a bit of me and i don't mind sharing that but uh i just wonder if that's something that you think would be good bad as far as what magicians should do to expose themselves emotionally they like that yeah they, i mean they should never expose themselves uh if it's to children uh you guys got to stop that um i had that in my lecture don't touch kids stop it um <laughs> every time i hear some uh, magicians in trouble i like there, there was one time the guy called me up and they're like, oh, my God, this guy, you know, uh, was arrested. And I was like, oh, no, what like what did he do? And they're like bank robbery. And I was like so relieved yeah. that it was bank robbery <laughs> uh, and that no kids were harmed. Thank God. Right, right. Um, but um, so, yeah, don't don't expose yourself to others um, without consent. But, uh, yeah, expose yourself um, in a in a metaphorical sense for sure. There, I don't think there's any bad side to it. Um, obviously, be consistent. I'm a comedy character. So if I really took the lights down and started talking about my grandma dying, it might be a little bit weird in my comedy magic show. But there might be a way to do it. Like I, I like as I say it, something I'm always excited by challenge. I always think, like, man, wouldn't this be crazy if, like, if I wouldn't if I made that moment, like, it would, like my Harrison on stage would do a very like a minute long monologue from you know. Yeah, like after you're talking about, talking about your grandmother dying, and then as you're smoking, saying, "This is some of her right now that's in my in my cigarette." Right, or I would just like <laughs> fart. I would just fart real loud, and just I have terrible gas, and I'm just trying to get through this speech. Like, talking about secrets, 
yeah. just something's not sitting right. <laughs> um, or, you know, it's, there would have to be a, a, every, a, you know, my, the other back half of my lecture is on comedy. And there always needs to be a twist. So, like, talking about how much your grandmother means to you, it would be sort of the premise. But you need that that twist, that break. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a really good joke has, like, a series of breaks. It'll break again and break again. Because that when you were talking about James Bond, I was thinking about that. James Bond, because you can't anticipate what James Bond is going to do, there is a version of James Bond that can surprise you. Like you can do a James Bond movie and and be surprising because you expect what he's going to do. So like as hmm. a character that's been around for a while, like a David Copperfield, I think David Copperfield has more of an ability to surprise you sometimes because you expect him to be a certain way. So if he does something out of character, he, he is such a spell. This goes back. This is a perfect full loop. When you talk about having a map so you can go off road, if your character is really, really strong, you can do something sort of out of character um, and and that that makes sense. Like I, there's I know a, a comedian who's like very clean and just like, hey, gang, how you doing? Mm-hmm. And somebody was heckling and he just turned to him and he said, F you. He actually said the word. Yeah. Um, and it was so out of character that it was the funniest thing because you knew that he meant business. <laughs> And I don't think it broke his character. It's one of those things where he was telling the audience in two words, what you've done is so bad that I am going to sacrifice the things that you know, because you know my character, you know that I don't want to do. So it it was very, very powerful. So because he had that map and he established the character, he had earned the right to go out of character for a second. And be able to bring people back in because they still loved him. Yeah. Ah, Very good point. Good point. So you can do it, but it all comes from that strong fundamental base. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice. A lot of really good stuff that you talked about here today, and I appreciate you being a guest. This is great that I'm glad able to uh, have been able to have you sit down for a minute because of how busy that you are, it seems like, all the time. <laughs> oh, no, I appreciate it. I uh, Yeah, I, I'm exhausted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the name of my podcast is called the Magic Word Podcast, and I always like to end by asking my guests what it is that's their magic word. What is your phrase, or what is it that's important? It could be a it's just your philosophy of life, basically. Obviously, it's Schwitz. Um, it's, my <laughs> magic Schwitz. word is, is always Schwitz. That's a very funny word. Uh, it has a V in the middle for no reason. Yiddish is, in general, just a funny language, and Schwitz <laughs> might be the height of that. Yeah. <laughs> Farfignugan? I'm not even sure what Farfignugan means. Farfignugan. I, I, I think it it's a, a made-up word. Yeah, That's I think Volkswagen made say. that up, didn't they? I don't know. That was that was an old Volkswagen commercial. From right, Farfignugan. Farfignugan. Blumkin is a hilarious word. It's any. It's funny when you have hard consonants. That's the key. Is a hard consonant, and uh, and then just it, yeah. Like WC but, Fields but, said with kumquats. Kumquat. Kumquat, kumquat is just a great. That's you can't get better than kumquat. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. That I mean, of all the fruits, that's that that's that's a very that's a fun one. Nectarine. I was I this I have weird conversations. We were talking about what's the funniest fruit. Yeah. And, uh, I've had that conversation. <laughs> and usually people think banana, but you know, seems to win because yeah. of the what it can do when you slip what's and the fall. Funniest fruit, and they were like Harrison Greenbaum. <laughs> Um, oh God, that's now we're, now we're going to get complaints. Here we um, go. <laughs> no, um, it's okay. It was self-deprecatory. We're uh, going part- off track again here, right? That's right. Exactly. <laughs> but I know where the map is. Okay. Um, nectarine is a very funny one. Nectarine is a very funny fruit. Mm-hmm. That's just a good one. Nectarine kumquat is, is though, I might that's have to amend the list that that's, that's pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> I have to remember that. Uh, yeah, pomegranate's not too bad, not too funny, but it doesn't have enough hard syllables in there. Uh, yeah, pomegranate. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Uh, I, a lot of fruits are just funny sounding. Pineapple is just great because what does it have to do with an apple? It's yeah. this is stuff we're work, we're workshopping our fruit bits is what we're well, doing. Well, <laughs> that's true. Well, maybe we take a schwitz, we can sit and talk about fruit. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, my, my this, grandma always did have, she always loved having a plum around. She did love a good plum. <laughs> but she was just plum crazy. That's there we go. All right, we're bringing it home. <laughs> All right. Harrison, thank you very much. It's been nothing short of fantastic just to spend a little bit of time with you and look forward to when we get together in the real world here sometime soon. Absolutely. And if you guys want to follow me, if you're listening, uh, at Harrison Comedy on Twitter and Instagram. My website's HarrisonGreenbaum.com. Uh, who books that? Dot com is every Wednesday. 
Uh, scam is magicscam.com. I have too many websites and projects, but go to, go to harrisongreenbaum.com. It's all there, and, uh, and there's pretty pictures. And don't go to this website. What Please don't go to this website.com. Please don't go to this website.com. <laughs> I love it. I love you, too. That's not even even the right address. Wait, it's please don't visit this website. (laughs) I'm going to have to buy the other one. Please don't visit this website. It's very confusing. Magicscam.com is easier. (laughs) (laughs) Got them all covered. Good. Thanks again, Harrison. I appreciate it for you being a guest. So until next time, that was Harrison Greenbaum. This is Scotty out. Well, that was a good one. Thank you, Harrison, very much for being my guest here this week. Uh, You kept me uh, laughing, and I still am when I'm going back and (laughs) listening to this to edit the whole thing. But I appreciate you being a guest this week on the Magic Word Podcast. That was just uh, wonderful. Thanks a lot, and I look forward to uh, seeing you again sometime soon. Well, I don't want to make this an overly long podcast, so I'll kind of cut to the point. We had a contest that ran a couple of weeks ago. It was for two copies, hard copies, of a book called No Ordinary Magic, which was written by Eileen McFalls and had to do with the life and times and travels with the late, great street magician, Jim Cellini. And she has graciously agreed to give away two copies of that book. And we have drawn two winners at random from our spreadsheet from the dozens and dozens and dozens of people who had registered for the contest. And we thank you guys very much. We know also that this was something, because it's a hard copy, it was limited really just to those people in the U.S. because of the rather prohibitive foreign shipping charges. Uh, So the two winners are from the U.S. and they are Jeffrey Cowan and Steve Sabo. Congratulations, guys. I know that you will enjoy this read. It's just a a delightful read and you will enjoy it and recommend it to your friends then too. So happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and I hope that uh, you enjoy the gift that you have just received. Compliments of Eileen McFalls. And again, Eileen, thank you for making that gift available. Well, since it is the gift giving season and because I know we do have a lot of international listeners and I want to include them as well, we're going to do something a little bit different and uh, special. First of all, what's uh, different is we're, not going to, we're going to start a contest here this week and run it for the next two weeks, not just with one, but two separate types of gifts that were prizes that we're going to be awarding. The first of which is going to be two copies, rather three copies of an ebook of John Gaspard's newest book, The Magic Square, which is part of the Eli Marks mystery novel series. And of course, you know is that Eli Marks is a a uh, fictional magician, and it's just a wonderful set of books that uh, he has uh, written. This series just continues to, to grow, and it's just a, a delightful uh, read and, uh, and a fun romp. I know that you guys, uh, the winners, will enjoy this, and if you don't win, you'll get an opportunity to, to buy the book if you want. But here's the cool thing. Number one, that it is an e-book that John is offering, and because that it seems that we've left out some of the international listeners in the past, we're going to have one of the contests forms is exclusively for those who are residing outside of the U.S. So this way that when you go to the magicwordpodcast.com, you will see several entry forms, but the first one is going to be for international listeners. So this way that if you will just put in your email address and your name, then we will uh, in a couple of weeks randomly draw a name. And because it is an ebook, we can uh, then John Grant Gaspard will be sending you a link so that you can have that. The other two books then are going to be for U.S. listeners and anybody else. I guess you can enter that as well if you are an international uh, listener as well. But uh, we're going to uh, limit the first one, so it's going to be exclusively for international, and uh, then the other two will be for whomever wants to register in that contest. The second uh, gifts or prizes that are going to be awarded were compliments of Charlie Randall with H&R Magic Books. He's the R from Randall, H being Richard Hatch that they had uh, long ago suspended that partnership and sold the business but the uh, but the books some books are still being published by Charlie Randall and he just completed uh, the publication of the latest in the Nick Trost series of subtle card creations this is volume number 8 and he has graciously agreed to donate six, count them, six different books. So there are a lot of opportunities for you to get a copy of this book. Now, this will be a hard 
bound book, which means, again, it's unfortunately, it's going to be limited to those who are residents of the U.S., but if you reside outside the U.S. and you will agree to pay for foreign shipping, we'll calculate what that's going to be, and if you agree to pay for that, fine. If not, then we will draw another name. But there will be six copies of that book, again, or that title, that will be awarded, and we're going to award all of those prizes on uh, Christmas Eve. That's going to be December 24th. So that uh, contest that we or these contests will be running now through uh, December the 24th. And so we'll wrap that up that afternoon, draw the names, and that will they'll be announced then in the podcast that goes out on the 24th. Uh, I'm sorry, actually I'll go through the 23rd. I guess that's right. Yeah, because we draw the names by noon on the day before. The uh, podcast comes out because the podcasts come out every Thursday morning at 9 o'clock Central Time. That's uh, GMT, GMT minus 5. Okay, well, a lot of stuff in there, and uh, I'm wishing you the best for the holidays. And also, you can keep up with all this stuff on our in our pod letter, so just be sure and subscribe to that. We are rapidly approaching the 1,000 subscriber mark for just the um, pod letter. We have just... Uh, uh, just as I said, just a, a few short of reaching the 1,000 mark for that. But uh, of course, for the podcast, we have ooh, probably closer to about 10,000 listeners who are out there. And so we love and respect and appreciate each and every one of you, and also for helping to share the magic by sped- spreading the word to everyone else, telling people about the magic word, and letting them know what a um, wonderful resource this is. We hope that you appreciate uh, the time and effort that we put into this. And again, want to remind you, if you'll just use uh, the link that's the bottom of the page of every Magic Word podcast page, there'll be a little logo for Amazon. And if you just click on that, it will take you to your Amazon page. Whenever you buy things on Amazon, we get a little piece of that. All righty, let's wrap this up. I didn't mean for this to quite go on so long, but there's just a lot of information to give you over here. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and... <laughs> relax, hey, relax, take a schwitz. <laughs> this is Scotty out. <laughs>